happy to announce the launch of our new logo. We have evolved since our incorporation in 1997 and it is time to refresh our new look to reflect who we are today. Before I reveal our new look, however, walk with me while I take you through our journey of the last 25 years. Trust Bank was incorporated on July 3rd, 1997 and began operations on October 1st, 1997. Following the collapse of the parent company of its predecessor, Meridian, the CBG stepped in and recapitalized the bank and held the shares in trust, thus the name Trust Bank. In 1999, the first investors who responded to the IPO and paid $1.50 per share received their maiden dividend of 50 bututs per share. In 2000, the bank fully paid back its investment by declaring another dividend of $1.20 per share, making it a cumulative dividend per share of $1.70, which was 20 bututs above the purchase price. Between 2002 to date, share capital has increased from $27 million to $200 million, indicating that the bank has grown organically by plowing back profits to increase capital, while at the same time paying dividends to shareholders. The bank was listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange in November 2002, being the first ever cross-border listing in the sub-region. Now let's talk about awards. The bank was awarded the insignia of the National Order of the Republic of the Gambia, ORG, in the year 2010 by His Excellency the President of the Republic of the Gambia. During the past years, the bank has received so many national and international awards. Banker Magazine, six times. Global Finance, six times. Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, five times. We began operations with three branches. Now, we have 18 branches and 20 ATMs and counting. On digital services, mobile app, check. Online banking, check. Transaction alerts, check. Watch this space, we've got more coming. Creating employment, yes, we've got that too. 400 and counting. And we take great care of our people too. Medical insurance, life insurance, private and state pensions, annual pilgrimages for both Muslims and Christians, training, yes, we do them all. One team, one family, one goal. That's the Trust Bank spirit. On corporate social responsibility, we have spent over $50 million in various courses. We care, and so we share. Over the years, we have paid over $1.6 billion to our shareholders, which translates to a whopping $20 per share and counting. Phenomenal returns for our shareholders who purchased at $1.50. Corporate taxes, over $1 billion is paid. Our journey started with a vision to create the kind of company that delivers quality services and innovative products with an inspired team dedicated to serving our customers, our environment, and our communities at large in the most caring manner. We remain fully committed to delivering excellent services to each of our stakeholders customers, employees, shareholders, and partners. So, we remain true to who we have always been. As we look forward to greater achievements, we are rebranding to reflect who we are today and the future that we inspire. Our new logo has been designed to visually demonstrate our Gambian heritage and the sophisticated nature of the bank. We are moving away from the navy and gold-colored parallelogram-shaped logo to our baobab tree with a rising sun in the background. The striking outline of our baobab tree at sunrise is a familiar sight to anyone who has spent time in the Gambia. Our new logo and visual identity are inspired by our core values and spirit of being a pioneer in providing a unique banking experience. It is a completely new look that better matches the transformation we have made as a company. But we remain your trust bank. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to present to you our new logo and corporate identity. For the first time in the history of the Gambia, Gambia Printing Publishing Corporation proudly introduces the Bibliomatic Exercise Book Printing Machine. The machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. 
With the Bulamatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non size restricted printing service supply across the sub region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable, and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. On the reason I have always called for a national dialogue is because a government must be responsive to the needs of its people. Fatu. Tell me one thing, if I'm me as drink. an individual, if I know that there is somebody that I definitely wrong, yeah. I will be bold enough, I will go to the party, I will appeal to him and apologize him. decision today because I don't make decisions lightly. I investigate. I do my research. I get the facts. I call the experts. I, I summon meetings. I get the technician. Then I reflect and I make a decision. Why did you lose the election? Well, we lost the election because of treatment and registration. We had evidence that people were registered before the opening of the registration. Hello and welcome to another edition of our show. It's another Thursday. And of course, today we're going to talk about the Gambian economy. And there's no other person to discuss this other than Dr. Gajigo. Doctor has been a frequent uh, commentator on this platform, but he has been away for some time. And a lot of you guys have been asking, where is Dr. Gajigo? We really want to hear from him, uh, considering all of these things that are happening in the country. Doctor, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a while. How have you been? I'm doing well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've missed this uh, appearing on this program, so I'm, I'm happy to be back. Wow. Glad to have you back. Esa, Dr. Yeah. Gajigo is our guest tonight, and we will be talking about the government economy, of course, the situation of our economy. We will look at all the things that have been happening, the Africa 50 mm -hmm. agreement, you know, the Banjul, Barra Bridge, you know, of course, the state of the nation addressed by the president, 
you know, from an economic aspect uh, perspective, you know, all of that uh, we'll be discussing with Dr. Gajigo this evening. Yeah, um, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Gajigo here. Um, I've also been following his um, comments or commentaries on the Fatu, uh, Fatu but um, I've never met him oh, um, actually, in person. This is so the first time? <laughs> it's the wow. first time we're meeting okay. in person, and it's a pleasure, sir, um, especially sharing platform with you. Um, of course, um, you have a wealth of knowledge um, on economic issues and a lot of issues that are happening in the country. Yeah. Um, I'm not an economist <laughs> by training, um, so I'm ready to learn yeah. um, while we you know, have a, an honest and frank conversation on issues happening in the country, but I'm also willing to learn um, from your pool of expertise and wealth of knowledge around issues, especially um, for what is of interest to me mm -hmm. um, is the mortgaging of these, um, you know, why are you Trans calling it mortgaging? Well, I'm calling it mortgaging. We will, we will, we will go in deep into that, and we, we know what is happening, and it's really unfortunate um, that you know the, the the minister of finance, you know, went to sign that um, agreement um, in, in in Togo. I think it's in Togo in Lome, July third to July fourth. Mm -hmm. It's really unfortunate, but you know those are issues that are of interest to me, and of course um, the economic, um, the state of affairs as well as our economy is concerned. Um, yeah. So, so I think it's important that uh, you know we bring people with expertise yeah. nowadays to look at the different sectors because you know we had Dr. Siddharth Job here and the kind of reaction I had from that interview, people really, in as much as they want to hear from the politicians, but they want to hear from experts because yeah. everybody is concerned about the state of our nation. People want to know what the realities are you know, coming from people that are not in directly in politics. So it's important that we have Dr. here. Doctor, once again, welcome to the show. Now, Thank let's you. start with um, the state of affairs of our economy. If you're going to give us that some, uh, we're going to sum up, you know, the state of our affairs, what would you say it is today as we speak? Yeah. Um, you know, there are a couple of ways you can look at this. Um, I, um, sometimes, unfortunately, the tendency is just to restrict yourself to technical discourse or technical indicators. But for me, you know, as a Gambian, somebody living in the country, you want to approach uh, these things uh, from the point of view how they impact the average Gambian. Yeah. So if you want to, um, so the, way, the question I ask myself, if I want to, um, to concretely address the economic situation, so you know, um, how would it appear to the average Gambian, let's say you meet in Serekunda market or in, in, in some other town? Yeah. Yeah. And from that point of view, I, I think, um, you know, it will not be controversial to say that people will tell you, you know, our economy is basically characterized by rising cost of living and stagnating income. You know, so this is the reality. Mm -hmm. We have a situation right now where our inflation rate is approaching about 18%. Yeah. This is a very significant acceleration. Wow. Um, during that, you know, if you look over the past uh, three years or so, the average income growth uh, per capita is about 2%. So on one hand, the cost of living is going up, you know, in double digits. Yeah. And the cost of income is anemic. Mm. So right there, that tells you the real income of the people are falling. So we, uh, to answer your question, in a nutshell, the economic situation is really bad. Um, it's, it, and it's not looking that it's not looking any way to improve anytime soon because we are not seeing any deceleration in inflation rate, and therefore the cost of living is going to stay high and probably even increase in the near future. But what is responsible for this? Government will tell you when they took over, they were not even assured of paying salaries for the next six months, right? That is stabilized. They have increased salaries, you know. Um, they, are, they, 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 they are building roads and all of these things. Uh, projects are coming into the country. Just before I come here, I saw a World Bank statement where the Gold Bank is giving additional financing to Gambia government how many grants and projects and financing that is coming into the country. Why are we in this situation? I am also told our debt has increased way more than when Jame was here, just in six years. Why are we in this kind of situation? Well, I mean, if you look at the basic structure, I mean, um, there is no secret here. If you want um, real development to occur, I mean, the, the, the structure of the economy has to change. You cannot just you know, if you if you listen to government officials, mm -hmm. or I mean, some of the things you quote, the things they tell you they they are doing, they'll focus mainly on 
projects that are coming from development partner A, B, C, World Bank, FA1, others. It's basically just continuation of business as usual from previous government. There hasn't been any fundamental change in the way the economy is structured or the way the economy is managed. It's essentially the same thing. So why, why do we have inflation rates so high, the cost of living so high? Because we import inflation. Most Our import as a percentage of GDP yeah. is currently approaching 60%. That is the highest it has been since 1970. If you go, the records that we have going far back goes all the way to 1970. Import share of GDP has, you know, currently is the highest it has ever been in the country. Export as a percentage of GDP is pretty much close to 5%. We, we don't export anything and it's been falling. So what, you know, these things that really matter, that tell you whether the economy is actually changing, it's, you know, it's been structured in a way to allow it to improve for people's standard of living to go up, all the indicators are going in the wrong direction. And because we import almost everything we consume, most importantly food items, it means when there is something happening outside, you know, we will import that uh, price shock. And, you know, but the problem is, do we really have to import everything that we are importing right now? If you look at our import, our balance sheet, just rice and oil alone that we consume, the import uh, bill of those is $150 million per annum. That actually, that alone exceeds our export, total exports. So there is a lot the government can do if you, know, if you really you know, genuinely look, look at the structure of the economy and uh, you want to make sure that we are not um, you know, operating business as usual, which, which will just exacerbate the existing problems we have. So what we have in a nutshell is just a very um, uh, a continuation of what has always happened and the, the government having either no desire or understanding of what it takes to change the structure of the economy. We are importing far more than we should import. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have a situation where we are importing everything, especially food items that we can produce locally, then this sort of high inflation rate, increasing cost of living, will always persist. So if I were, uh, were to ask a government official, I'll say, what are you doing to make sure that you know, we do not import our, infl I mean, our inflation as we do so that the cost of living in the Gambia is affordable? Now, d d there might be a lot of factors that reason why we have a uh, high cost of food. Because, you know, whenever I talk to government officials, all the time I had them, somebody here, and they were talking about how our exchange, how our, um, you know, government is doing with the economy, how the gov economy is stable, even the World Bank is applauding them and all that stuff. But my thing is, I am not feeling it. I'm buying bag of rice higher today compared to six years ago, sugar, uh, even bread is on the high, is, 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 is high today, and cash power, 40% increment. Every single Gambian is crying about that, and we, we still don't have electricity regularized. But they will tell you, you know, it, it has to do with inflation, it has to do with uh, Ukraine war, and today, I, I was changing the, the, the pound sterling, is at 80 dollars. The SEFA is at Sam meal is at a hundred dollars, is a hundred and ten dollars is today as we speak. Now there's no control when it comes to exchange rates. People just can sit at their corners and, and, and just set prices and nothing happens. When a country operates like that, somebody I remember there was a time some like a few months ago, government set a price for bag of cement mm -hmm. and said this should be the price. Nobody should sell above that. And I went to the shop and the shopkeeper was selling it at 380 when government said it should be 350. Mm -hmm. And my dad said you should go to the police. I said if I go to the police station, the next minute the guy will not sell to me and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. If things like that continue to happen and no, there's no price control, there's no regulation when it comes to foreign exchange, what becomes our economy? Is that the reason why we have all of this inflation or, you know, the instability in pricing? No, I mean, you hit on, uh, I think, all the major points. I mean, first of all, let's get something straight. The World Bank is not applauding the, the Gambia government. Oh, See, okay. a lot of these international organizations, because they, you know, this, they are, the governments are development partners. They are very careful. They use certain diplomatic language. Mm. Now, it can come across as if you are praising a government, when in reality, if you are very, if you listen very carefully, I mean, if you read very carefully and read between the lines, they actually are offering very strong criticisms. 
uh, for instance, you know, you know, wh when we have a budget situation where it, um, you know, there's always persistent deficit or there's no budget discipline, the government will come at the beginning of the year and present one budget, then come much later in the year with a very drastically different expenditure plan. Mm -hmm. Um, at the end of the year, when IMF or the World Bank is looking at this, they will mention something like fiscal slippages. Yeah. For most Gambians, that sounds like a, that's, uh, you know, most people, that would just be a very anodyne phrase. Mm -hmm. But uh, the actual accurate term, yeah. though it will not be diplomatic, would mm -hmm. be to say that there is no budget discipline. And we all know the word discipline is a very strong mm -hmm. language. Yeah. But in diplomatic parlance, you would avoid such words. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm trying to say, first of all, is let's get something out of the way. I don't see any, uh, any international institution, whether it's ADB, the UN, uh, IMF, or the World Bank, praising the Gambia government on economic performance because it is not there. So um, if they say that they are just muddying the waters and okay. they are trying to kind of... Um, you know, take advantage of the fact that the diplomatic language is used by this international institution is, you know, for, you know, for obvious reasons, they can't use strong yeah. and, you know, direct language. But, I mean, I think this, this point you, you, you mentioned, the issue of inflation being imported and exchange rate, mm -hmm. they are very linked. Okay. What determines the exchange rate of your country? I mean, of your country's currency, is, is, is the demand of um, other countries for your goods and services. If other countries demand a lot of what you produce in order with what you export, then the value of your currency goes up. If you don't export but you import, that means you are demanding other currencies and there isn't much demand for yours. The value of your currency falls. So as I mentioned earlier, the fact that the inf um, imports in the country are at their highest mm -hmm. seems close to independence and our exports are around their lowest. Right there, that already tells you the situation about currency. So our currency will continue to depreciate as long as we do not produce and export things. As long as we continue to import <coughs> items, this, uh, the currency. So the issues of like Ukraine or COVID, they are not the cause of the problems we are doing. They just exacerbate, they just aggravate them. Hmm. Yes, because what Ukraine pretty much did was increase, you know, it, it, it led to, the Ukraine war led to a disruption in supply chains and then the cost of commodities like energy, fertilizer, rice, things went up. Yeah. Yes. But those things, even without the Ukraine war, the price of rice will continue to go up. Why? Because our currency depreciates in value and we are increasing more of it. So those will go up. Now, of course, Ukraine war led to some significant increase, but it is not the cause of it. It just aggravates a problem that already exists. Mm. It's the same thing with COVID. Uh, our tourism sector hasn't really, there hasn't been any um, real improvement in it. Like, if you look at our tourism sector, what it, how it is now, and how it was in the 70s, there is no fundamental difference. We just depend on people who come, spend a few weeks, two weeks at the beach, yeah. and then go. We, have not ha we don't have any other means of attraction to try to develop other means of attractions to make sure that we, uh, we spread uh, you know, tourism, uh, uh, tourists coming from a larger range of countries, making so that they go inside and spend money on other items. They just come to the beach two weeks and they return. Yeah. So when there is a shock like COVID, where, where there are travel restrictions, you know, people will, you know, there are beaches in almost every coastal country. Mm -hmm. They don't have to come very far. They can even stay in Europe, yeah. you know. So a shock like that would be felt very significantly. And since our agriculture, like groundnut, our exports in those areas have been going down anyway, with or without Ukraine, yeah. When you have a little shock to tourism sector, you're going to have a huge effect on our export and our foreign exchange earnings. So all of this, and the fact that we have not been having foreign direct investment, investment. because that's another window, another factor that can come in and um, uh, increase the demand for our currency. But if you listen to our government officials, especially the Minister of Finance, for instance, recently he was uh, speaking on CNBC Africa, talking about yeah. all the new economic initiatives coming to the country. What is remarkable about the things he was listing is that every single item was projects with the World Bank, ADB, development partners. None of them involved a major investment initiative that is uh, with a private you know, investor. investor. What that is telling you is that we have not improved our investment climate to such a way that to give confidence for investors to come in.
even energy projects that we have, when you list them, they are oil World energy Bank. project, World, World Bank. Bank. We don't have independent power producers coming in. And this is really where the this is where you determine whether or not the, the, the economy is being handled in the right way. Is the, uh, the current government, are they, are they having the right stewardship to make sure that the confidence is there, not only for mm. foreign investors coming in, but Gambians to want to come back. But what do we have instead? We have the problem of too many Gambians leaving, and now we have to deal with deportations uh, uh, coming. But, yeah. you know, so this is the I think um, uh, the meat of the matter. So when you have this situation, the cost of the, coming back to the main question, yeah. the fundamental structure of the economy hasn't changed. So currency will continue to depreciate. Mm -hmm. We will continue to import goods that we, did not, we don't need to import, which means we will continue to import inflation, mm -hmm. which means the cost of living will continue to go up. Wow. And right now, I don't hear anything from these government officials, whether it's the Ministry of Finance, whether it's, whether it's the President during his State of the Nations address, you know, that shows that, number one, they have a very good understanding of the problem. Number two, they actually have a concrete and implementable plans to shift the, um, uh, you know, to ride the ship, so to speak, to, uh, to fix the problem. So going back to the State of the Nation address, we discussed it here and everyone was saying it's, there, there was no innovative way, there was no concrete plan as to what direction we are going to take. It is all about just giving us a situation uh, report as to what is happening. Um, and again, during the budget session, I said this here, if you look at all the budget allocations as a country, apart from you go to the main ministries, agriculture, health, all of the projects on the agriculture and health are not government it's not money that our taxpayers are you punching in. It is projects from World Bank, from ADB, from whoever. It's all donor monies. Mm -hmm. And these monies are tied to something. Mm -hmm. If, for example, um, uh, for example, if the United States is giving you money and they are tying it to good governance and other human rights issues, and you slip in those, those projects will delay because they, they you know, they, you know, it's based on the performances on what it is tied to. So you look at our economy itself. Most of the budget allocations that our mo own money that we put in, most of it is at the office of the president, travels, vehicles, and others. But then all of the other things are projects. Yeah. What does that show? Does that show that, that our priority is not development? Yeah. Our priority is just getting the projects to do all the developmental projects, wherever it, stop, it stops there. But the other things like Office of the President or travels or vehicles, those people cannot suffer. We make sure our own money is injected in that. Because that's what I see, agriculture, health, education, these three areas, mm -hmm. everything in those departments. 90% of the projects are, are, are funded projects from the international donor partners. Is that the direction we should take? Uh, obviously not. Obviously not. I mean, look, uh, when you look at the budget each year, and I've been examining our budget every single year since this government came to power, and you, you really, it's very difficult to see the budget looking fundamentally different from what it was during the Jame era. Mm. Yes, and, and this is a problem. Because number one, uh, when you have, um, you know, we, uh, we may not have, um, you know, from year to year basis, you, can, you, you are quite constrained as to how much resources you can raise. Yeah. But what you do have a lot of control over is to prioritize your expenditures. You need to have a very, you know, clear look at saying this is the country's situation. This is where we want to go in mm -hmm. the medium term, in the long term. And your budget expenditure needs to reflect that. And uh, as you said, when you look at the budget, it doesn't reflect that. The Gambia situation as it is right now, for, for us to really move, we need to have, for, for, for you to have any structural change in the economy, you need to have structural transformation in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that has to be preceded by very strong growth in productivity. And the, uh, the budget allocations that we have in agriculture are simply not uh, consistent with that. And we have a lot of allocations in areas yeah. that have no productive value for the, for the economy. I'm, I'm sorry, I mean, you can't have that amount of funds for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And even though the budget outlays to the Ministry of Agriculture is higher, yeah. 
But when you also look at the budget in each ministry, in each sector, yeah. the difference between recurrent expenditures and, 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 and development expenditures, you know, uh, the, the part we, where you actually have to invest is huge. A lot of these ministries where you actually need investment in, a lot of it is just recurrent things, things that will go into just as, um, covering expenditures. Very small fraction goes into development, mm -hmm. you know. So the budget doesn't reflect the, the, the priorities that need that um, you know that we need to set as a country to move forward. So when you have a situation like that, you can have you know forget you can come and get millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from development partners. It will not be put to good use because you can take a small amount of money and do something great with it if you invest it greatly or wisely. You can take a large amount of money and waste it and get zero result. It all depends on what you know the value for money i mean um, what you are able to get based on what you invest in mm -hmm. so as you said you are obviously right when you listen to the president on the state of the nation's address mm -hmm. when he was talking about the projects in agricultural sector it's yeah. all about projects from you know ifad fao uh, adb world bank these little projects let me tell you as someone who has worked in these institutions those institutions don't develop a country there are number of projects don't develop a country the development of the country comes from the country itself first determining what their needs are. Finding, approaching this institution and say, this is the projects we want to do based on our priorities, based on our context and our priorities and our development vision. And then you, in, together with those institutions, you design a project. But those projects, will, no matter what, whether or not you know, we approach projects like this will come from these institutions. Yeah. They have to, you know, yeah. they have to go and do projects in other countries. Yeah. We can have a thousand projects from FAO, a thousand projects from IFA, from ADB, from World Bank. They will not change anything. And we have seen it over yeah. the past, for the past seven years. or eight years or yeah. for the past, even during the height of the, the, the Jame, Jame era, you know, were there were projects coming in. Yeah. But at the, what can you say, can anybody honestly say, okay, here, this is the, uh, the significant change we have had in the agricultural sector, in the uh, health sector, mm -hmm. in the education sector. Tourism as well. Uh, to, you know, you can say that for any sector. So Energy, the point yeah. here is, is the number of the projects by now, it should be obvious to anyone, especially to the, president, uh, to the president and to the ministers, that it is not the number of projects that lead to development. You know, you have to demonstrate that the, the resources that are coming in, your development partners are doing all of the things they, you know, they, they are doing. But now it's up to you to implement those projects to make sure that they are having a difference and those differ uh, differences in the lives of the people is sustained over time. And this is what we are lacking currently in the country. And talking about these development partners, even though we know it's going to be difficult, relying on them the alone will not bring any development to our country, but they still bring something to the country. Now, if, if those de um, development partners are even threatened by physical discipline, for example, global, what's it called, global, um, the, the guys, the people that uh, Minister of Health are supposed to pay back 10, 10 million or else yeah. they threaten to go. I think, well, I forgot, just remember the name. It's something global, right? Mm -hmm. And then FAO, no, WFP, World Food Program. Mm -hmm. They have been here for the longest. Even I don't know whether I was even born. Mm -hmm. They have been here. They are also canceling a $22 million uh, project that they have with the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Now, what, f even in Jamie's time, you know, I know some of these projects will go because of human rights issues, but not because of mismanagement and others. What does that say, Esa, as to what direction we are taking? I mean, it's not just our own resources, but now we're talking about resources by donor partners. Because even the Ministry of Health confirmed that, yes, there was a problem with the, the, people, the project managers, you know, managing that funding, and they're going to refund that money taxpayers' money is going to be used to refund this $10 million. And yeah. still we haven't heard of any arrest. And we were told they were going to do investigations. Yeah. Um, 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 I think um, Dr. Gadigo has just done justice to um, the questions that have been raised. Um, he's given us a rundown of the economic situation um, of the country. Um, <clears throat> just like um, Kenyan Professor Piolo Lumumba will say, um, we live in an, in an Africa where romantic, romantic economies will say, oh, the economy is growing, when in reality it is stagnating. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it is always the language of politicians. It is the language of 
you know, so-called bureaucrats that or technicians that are working in government who just want to please the leadership, who just want to please the president because you feel like maybe the president has no understanding or clue of how the economy works. And this is the sad reality of Africa, um, Gambia in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he made mention of very salient points. Um, and I think, um, even though I'm not an economist, um, but he can correct me if I'm wrong, I think, um, you know, the issue of inflation, which is at 17 point something percent, um, close to 18 percent, you're talking about a country of um, having um, debt stock of $100 billion um, as of April um, 2023. Um, and, of course, you know, importing, relying a lot on importation than we export. I think these are... Um, these are you know, factors responsible for um, the current economic situation that we are in. And of course, um, he made mention of the issue of investment, foreign direct investment. Um, this is important, but you know, countries or investors can only have confidence and trust in a country um, when the, you know, the, the, the environment is suitable. We're not only talking about the political environment, because mostly mm -hmm. um, this government will say, okay, um, even when they came to power in 2017, um, all that they tried to make Gambians believe is that um, investors will now come. Then they were not ready to come because of the dictatorship that we had here and all that. Now it's a democracy, they will come. But no, investors are not only attracted by that. But also, even the energy issue, they are attracted by the energy issue. You have to stabilize the energy situation. But in a country where energy is not stabilized, NAVEC increased, um, is it 37 or 40 yeah. percent? And, and when they did this, I'm sorry to say, but they lied to us because they said, well, we are doing this so that we provide better services. And but services are not better up to now. No. Um, so the energy situation itself... Um, once it is not regularized, once it is not stabilized, it can um, scare away investors um, from coming to the country. And when you talk about, um, of course, um, the diplomatic language to use when they will say, um, what is the term again? Is it financial slippage or whatever? Mm. Um, yes, they have to be diplomatic with the language. Um, but in reality, what they know is that um, there is no fiscal discipline in the country. Um, okay, for example, with all the projects that are coming in, when you listen to the... State of the Nation address. With all the projects that are coming into the country, at some point, these international financial lenders will also look at the, 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 the fiscal discipline in the country. How the government is spending. Okay, What are they prioritizing? Mm -hmm. And what are they not prioritizing? Yeah. This is important to them. Um, one, okay, every year we will rely on budget support. Okay, That's one. Secondly, um, you talk about salary increment. I think it was, um, you know, a hot topic here yeah. when they increase salaries. But I, I said this when the government was increasing salaries. I said at some point, they know the economic situation will be bad, um, living cost will be high, okay? And what they can do now in order to just, as usual, fool the ordinary Gambian is that, yes, high, there's high cost of living, but at least we have increased salaries. So that at least the average Gambian or the only Gambian who has no understanding of how the economy goes will say, yes, of, of course, manu uh, da but your salary is fanal lafale. But is this sustainable? Secondly, you look at um, the increment of salaries, for example, from the, um, the president himself, mm -hmm. come to the speaker of the National Assembly, the deputy speaker, mm -hmm. and of recent um, vehicles, you know, being bought for parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. And the number of advisors being increased. Um, we're going to the office of the president. These are all issues at some point. These financial lenders will sit back and say, what is really happening here? Is there any fiscal discipline? Is there any financial discipline in this country? Um, when a country is struggling and complaining of you know, economic hardship, high cost of living, but then still um, is not um, putting money where it should be put in. Just um, when we had um, Dr. Siddharth Job here, we were talking about... Um, you know, City for Sonko being appointed um, in Turkey. Yeah. I mean, just, it was out there. I in was, fact... I saw the story yeah. on our, yeah, actually, website. In, in fact, in fact, it's, it's not, not budgeted budget for. It's not yeah. budgeted for at the embassy in, in Ankara. Yeah. So, meaning you're going to cater for him as well, just because you want to compensate him politically. Yeah. So, these are issues that um, really we need to um, look into. And... You know, most of these um, financial lenders are also at some point, even the audit report, mm -hmm. you know, Karambature was here. Yeah. And he said, because when we talk about a lack of financial discipline, when we talk about accountability, transparency and all that, at some point, even these development partners are worried about it. Okay. 
Yes, they wouldn't come as he said directly with mm -hmm. such a language or term, mm -hmm. but even their actions, even you know some of the steps that they would want to take regarding management of their projects tells you that really they don't have trust and confidence in the government. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tude made Benson hear that the tremendous work they've been doing. Um, even the, some of these development partners have started saying that, look, yes, we, we recognize the work that you're doing and we will even want you to help us when it comes to auditing some of the projects and all that you'll bring here. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that mm -hmm. really the level of trust and confidence they have in the government when it comes to management of these projects is not there. You talked about the $10 million that should be refunded, those global fund. Mm -hmm. What is the government doing about that? You're talking about rampant corruption in the country. You're talking about the, 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 the mismanagement of the COVID funds. Mm -hmm. The National Audit Office report has clearly put out all these things. And the international development partners are not seeing the government taking significant steps to address these issues. Mm -hmm. So it is not only about having a democratic government, a government that respects you know, civil and political rights, freedom of expression and all that. But it is also fundamentally about how you manage the resources of the country. That financial discipline must be there. But once that is missing, um, then you tend to have a problem. So in the final analysis, um, we tend to have a government that either, either does not understand the current economic realities of the country or deliberately, I saw on the... Um, in an article this morning that I was reading, I think it was published yesterday. I can't remember the me particular media house. Mm -hmm. I think it was on the Standard newspaper. Um, there is a Gambian in the UK who was talking about the Senegambia Bridge issue. Mm -hmm. And he said, what is happening is that he's fearful that it seems most of the ministers or these ministers and, you know, um, public officials are preparing for early retirement. Maybe they are retiring and they are preparing to take more money, put it in their pocket, put it in their bank accounts, yeah. so that when they are not, <laughs> when they are not in office, they, they, so they're willing to loot from the taxpayers um, just to prepare for early retirement. And so that's why I said, it's either the government does not understand, because for me, with all due respect, the president, all of us know the president has no understanding of economy and how this works, what are the implications and all that. And he is relying on people around him. So if the finance minister... Um, either has no understanding of the current economic realities or is deliberately misleading um, the president and the government, um, then we find ourselves in a very a funny, funny and sad situation, situation, I must say. Is, doctor, is it what Esa said, you know, how, you know, number one, he talked about our debt limit, mm -hmm. that we are in, in the red zone mm -hmm. right now. We, mm -hmm. we should, I think we, will, we also should address that. Yeah. But when this government came, there was so much goodwill. Yeah. We didn't have to go this far when it comes to debt, this debt situation that Absolutely. we are in. At this point, mm -hmm. I don't know if we can attract any more debts. Mm -hmm. And someone told me, I am not an economist, but someone was telling us, I'm like, I need to know what's going on. Someone told me, this is the reason we are even going into this kind of arrangements now. Mm -hmm. It's because maybe we cannot attract so much debt anymore because we are in the red zone right mm -hmm. now. But again, when this government came in, there was so much goodwill yes. from the international community. Um, 1.3 billion. President Ko, hani nyangu mo fa fa ulo lo ma fa nyangu mo fa ngobe nyingko do nafta sa ito fa ba iba kalam talal. But as we speak, none of us is feeling it because the money is not has not come, is either not coming, never going to come. And what happened? Why did we lose all of that goodwill? Is it still? Is there a possibility that we can still get it, or is it over for us? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you are, you are absolutely right. When this government came to power, it was inaugurated. Yeah. There was a lot of goodwill. I mean, number one, our development par partners, uh, for example, the EU, that yeah. had suspended its assistance uh, to the Jambia government, yeah. it, re uh, it resumed mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, you had, you know, even at, at, you know, at the level of ordinary Gambians, those who were abroad, some mm -hmm. even thought about, even some actually came back. Mm -hmm. I personally know of Gambians who were in the U.S. wanted to come back. And yeah invest in the country but within a few years many of them packed their bags and, and went left. back yeah yeah um you know you can have it, it doesn't i mean uh, you can have all sort of loans even whether they are completely you know grants yeah or loans with very low, concessional loans with low interest or you know or even loans with high interest what matters is when you get resources what you do with it, with it yeah and you know, um, talk is one thing, but 
we are all living in the country. You know, if after seven years, if things have actually been progressing as they should have, we, all know. we don't need to go and consult some, you know, technical indicators. You know, for me, the most reliable and concrete indicator is asking the average Gambian. Now, how do, you feel? What, how do you feel right now relative to what it was few years back? Mm -hmm. well, and few years back, what you th where you thought you would be? Yeah. Are you there now? Mm -hmm. And the answer, no matter which Gambian you speak to, unless maybe a few in government who seem to be oblivious and enjoying it, but if you talk to the average Gambian, they will tell you things are harder now than they have been. Mm -hmm. And if you had asked them seven years ago where the things would, you know, where they expect the country to be, where they expect to be, with or without any outside crisis, people would have told you that uh, they expected to be in a far better situation than they are in. So the issue of the debt, obviously we had debt because um, of, you know, we have to admit that some of the debt was legacy loans that were taken before. Yeah. But we are still taking some financing, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's domestic debt or outside. You see, there's nothing in principle uh, wrong with taking debt. What matters, as I said before, is what you do with it. Because in the Gambia, there should be no shortage of investment opportunities for the government to realize economic and social returns that far exceed any interest rate mm -hmm. that somebody might charge. Yeah. So it's, it's not for lack of um, opportunities to invest in. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that the resources are coming in, our development partners, as you said, with all the goodwill that, uh, that, that we had at the beginning. You know, uh, it just did not, uh, the government didn't um, take advantage. I mean, we, it, that window has closed. Yes. We are now in a situation where, in fact, some of the, the, these develop, development partners would actually, you know, may cut back on the assistance. And some have, you know, may start actually mm -hmm. insisting that unless certain actions are done, they are going to scale back or completely stop whatever assistance they are doing. Or they will look for some ways of going around the central government because they've lost faith in central government. Some might look at going towards maybe maybe local government I, or NGOs. Exactly. That or what, that's what I have seen, especially the EU doing now. Mm -hmm. You see the EU and even the UNDP going through local governments. Exactly. Yeah. Because you the kept project in KMC. Exactly. U UNDP is doing projects with uh, US, um, Banjul and, and, and I think uh, LRR. Exactly. You see them now diverting to local governments. Exactly. Which is why I, I think uh, Barrow's government tried everything they can to try to unseat the, uh, those existing um, <laughs> yes. uh, local government leaders. But the fact of the matter is an inter it's, it's far easier for an international organization or international body or international, I mean, a foreign government to deal with the central government. It's a lot easier. If they are going to the trouble of bypassing the central government, it means they've really lost faith in the ability of this government to, you know, to get things done. And, and, and you know, just to, you know, add to some of the great points that ASA so raised, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, this particular part, I mean, um, it's it's just outstanding, uh, you know, astounding to me that you can have um, the audit uh, office in the government yeah. make an investigation, and then the government going the, the president of the country saying that's an opinion, yeah. you know, that just shows that there is no seriousness to address the, some of the fundamental problems that are leading to the implementation failures that we are having with projects, mm -hmm. because. It, that's like saying that, that's like uh, the attorney general or the government saying that, oh, if a prosecution makes a charge against somebody, it's just an opinion. Don't, don't, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a minister is charged with corruption and they have been taken to court, it's not a process, it's just an opinion. Oh. You are actually undermining a very, very important institution in the country. And it, it is, the auditing plays a very good role because it's one of the few things we have that can hold government officials accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm for delivering on what they are supposed to deliver. And when you undermine that by going uh, in front of the nation and you're saying that uh, that is um, basically, it's just an opinion, you know, you, you, uh, you basically undermine all of the good work those people are doing and then you give confidence to any official that might be thinking of doing, you know, improper things with public resources. So it tells you that uh, it, it, it tells you all you need to know as to whether we should have confidence that this government can right the ship in terms of improving the implementation capacity. 
So you can have all sort of funding, whether it's grant, whether it's some new akin form of financing, whether it's a commercial loan. It doesn't really matter the arrangement. As long as the implementation capacity is not there and <coughs> implementation failure becomes the order of the day, there will be no results. Someone can say uh, government is taking steps to address uh, corruption. Uh, for example, um, when the audit report uh, for councils came up, government set up a commission of inquiry to commission the, 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 the councils. Mm -hmm. Commission is right now undergoing. And, um, but again, uh, and also when Dr. Banja was accused of bribery, government prosecuted him. He's in jail right now. I mean, the same argument can be said of uh, a minister who the government himself are accused of misconduct because that is a section they quoted when he was resigning and they said he did something contravening his position. Uh, we still don't know. Mm -hmm. There have been reports that he was questioned, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. Someone told me he saw about a few days ago driving his official vehicle. I don't know how true that is. I do know there are people, the COVID mm -hmm. funds, mm -hmm. there were investigations. Malagan did a damning mm -hmm. report mm -hmm. on the COVID funds. Mm -hmm. As we speak, I know of somebody who is right now at the police station mm -hmm. who was given over 40 million Gambian taxpayer money to go buy rice. You remember the time government was giving people yeah. to bring rice? Mm -hmm. This guy was giving over 40 million dollars mm -hmm. to bring rice. He didn't bring a single bag of rice. And nobody is talking about it. Nobody heard about it. Mm -hmm. And I heard the government spokesperson mm -hmm. was talking about it, saying they will do something. But what are they doing? What have they been doing? It's been two years since yeah. then. And one t at one point you could say, okay, they're trying so much to address this because they're doing uh, in the, for, there's for, a commission of inquiry on co local councils and Banja has been tried. But again, what about the other yeah. areas? Um, Is it selective justice? Uh, okay, yeah. maybe Dr. 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 Yeah. I, 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 yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, you see, of course, you know, like they say, a, a, even a broken clock can be right twice a day. So it wouldn't be, you know, uh, even Jamez time, some people were uh, prosecuted uh, despite his horrendous track record as a leader who, who were prosecuted for certain things. So, yeah. Of course, it, there will be so, some incidences here and there yeah. because they cannot afford to. I mean, some, 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 you know, they have to do something just to kind of, it's like a safety valve, just to tell people, let people know that doing they something. are doing something. But the fact of the matter is, if you start listing this, of course, you'll, you'll, you'll come, you'll, you know, you'll list to like three or four or five uh, prominent cases. But very soon, you run out of things to list. Now, tell me, those few cases that are being publicized and prosecuted, if you um, do you think that is um, reflective of the degree of mismanagement that we have in the country? It no. obviously will be a drop in the bucket. Yeah. I mean, it's like but a, a, a is just what hundred thousand. Yeah. Well, uh, allegedly, and he and, and he wasn't the only one in the ministry yeah. in that particular investigation. Well, was named. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody more prominent was actually named, but yeah. we didn't see a single case against that person. So for me, when you actually list those cases uh, that it seems that the government is doing something about it. That's actually even more damning because when you compare it against the scale of the, you know, the examples you gave in the COVID mismanagement, yeah. you know, all other, um, you know, even in negotiations, contract negotiations that have been done yeah. in other things. Security in, in, Yeah. In many countries, something like that is a jailable offense because if you go and negotiate something and it costs the country and it, basically you've, it's not a basic issue of not failing to do due diligence. It's economic crime, you know. So, the uh, the fact of the matter is 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 um, those few examples of where they are doing something. It's almost like a joke because compared to the scale of the misdeeds that are happening, it's nothing. So, I don't see. I, I wouldn't list those cases to praise them for anything. The question would be why only those few cases yeah. when we have a lot more. Just just to add on to that, I think. Um you know, starting with um, the Minister of Fisheries, um, Dr. Banja's case, um, you have said it. He wasn't the only one. Um, on record, we had him even mention the minister's name, mm -hmm. um, who was James Gomez at the time. And nothing happened there. And e even if you talk, talk, talk about Dr. Banja's case, because it was out there, and the Malagan did follow this matter, Mustafa Dabo yeah. specifically, followed this matter, and it was known to everyone. There was no way that um, Dr. Banja could escape um, from all the allegations levied against him at the time. So the government had no choice, but at least, just like you said, they will want to take few examples. Because that is why if you listen 
um, to the president when he was calling the audit report as an opinion, he mentioned Dr. Banja's case. Yeah. You see, Dr. Banja, we had evidence and we took him to court. So if you have evidence, come. We cannot take people to court. And I'm like, this country is a joke, a president talking like this. Um, but you see, when you take Dr. Banja to court for that, the, and that will take me to the, um, the councils, mm -hmm. commissions being set up in the councils. The former chief executive officer yeah. of KMC, Senabu Martins, mm -hmm. confess. Mm -hmm. It's there on the records. Yeah. Of receiving bribery, 30,000 dollars. Nothing happened to her. All that you did was to elevate her. Is it elevate or whatever to move her? Is it I'm Kerewan administrative um, area or area council? Mm -hmm. That's one. Mm -hmm. So you've been selective. But even before that, let's go back. Um, from the Janet Commission, when this government came, they've just been selective. When it comes to the Janet Commission, to reports and recommendations, see what happened. Mm -hmm. um, some people were spared, mm -hmm. and some people were being targeted mm -hmm. um, to say you cannot even serve in, 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 in a public office. Mm -hmm. Okay? From there, the councils, when you talk about the commissions that are being set up <coughs> in the councils, it's really sad. I think we have talked about this repeatedly. Yeah that everybody knows that this is just um, politically motivated, it's just witch hunt. Because if you rely on the National Audit Office report, it's a shame for you to rely on the National Audit Office report um, to set up a commission of inquiry into the councils and even looking at how the proceedings are going. Um, a lot of, I'm, not, I'm not even following that because I'm, it's not of interest to me. But if you look but at it, it's so damning for the ministry. Exactly. That is what I'm saying. People that are following us say, telling us that it's damning for the ministry. So yeah. it's not even good for them. Mm -hmm. And that is why it has not attracted that much attention from the public yes. because people are so disappointed with it. Mm -hmm. If you rely on the National Audit Office report to set up that commission, the, national, the same National Audit Office report has made a lot of revelations. The secure report um, contract that has been negotiated. Even the Ministry of Justice, the mm -hmm. Attorney General's office, mm -hmm. did advise the government against going down. Mm -hmm. Even the Ministry of Tourism, mm -hmm. Tourism, mm -hmm. yeah. imagine, mm -hmm. yeah. advised the government going against, I mean, in, in going for that contract. Mm -hmm. But the president went on. Um, public finance laws and tax laws all have been violated in the country. Mm -hmm. The office of the president went and dubiously negotiated this contract and it's awarded. Mm -hmm. You go to Banjul project as well. You look at that one as well. We're talking about over $40 million being pumped into the Banjul project and the capital flooded. The president, all that he had to say is that, well, you know, when there's problem, let's come together and solve it rather than, you know, the blame game. So you look at all those issues. And you see, it's not only Gambians watching. But the international community is watching mm -hmm. the government. These reports are out there. Okay, everybody has access to them, mm -hmm. and the government is not doing enough um, to ensure mm -hmm. that the appropriate actions are taken. Because if you should do that, even the office of the president um, will be implicated at some point. So they wouldn't want to go into that. So uh, even if you look at the issue of um, the minister of, um, um, you know, Abasanya yeah. resigning, for example, um, I think when we had the program here the other time, um, you know, Jamanka said it. The minister is resigning because you believe that he has done something, um, a misconduct, mm -hmm. contrary to his position as a minister. Why should he even allow him to resign in the first place? Why not arrest him, investigate and prosecute if necessary? Why should you even allow him to resign and then coming out to say, I accept your resignation. And thank you for your service. And thank you for your... This is an insult to this country. Mm -hmm. And all these things are happening... You look at him, um, he's talking about the World Food Program. Yeah. Um, Dr. You know, Dr. Um, Job mentioned that these things are happening in the country, especially with the World Food Program. Mm -hmm. And everybody is quiet as if nothing is happening, happening in the country. Yeah. And then you, you mentioned civil society and all that. With all the things that are happening, we're talking about the Senegambia breach of recent. Everybody is quiet about this. Okay? And that is why I've, I've, I've concluded that this, the, the situation in the Gambia is... We have a bunch of, you know, looters, a bunch of um, people that are not interested in the development of this country. We are watching them destroy the future of this country, and everybody is quiet about it. And nobody is spearheading the destruction of the future of this country but the president himself. Because if you look at what happened in this country, Dr. Gadigo, you've traveled, you ex exposed, you know what is happening outside there. I think some of these things can only happen in the Gambia. And everybody goes to sleep in peace, nobody talks about it. To the extent that the government is even used to scandals now. 
It will happen just one, two days. They say, you know, they'll it. talk about it on social media for three days. For and three days. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's over. Three days. But the future yeah. of this country is being destroyed. Yeah. I, am, I am afraid. Because, you see, this country, uh, we are not fixing this country for us, mm. the generation. Mm. Okay? And that is this difference, or even though I hate to admit it, but there is the difference between us and the Western world. When they are building their country, developing their country, they don't build their countries for the present generation. They build it for the future generation. They plan for them. Mm -hmm. But then what are we planning for, 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 for the future generation? And time will come when our kids and grandkids will ask us this fundamental question. What did you do for this country? Mm -hmm. Because in, in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, well, I don't think Gambia is even ready to move in, even in 100 years' time. I think maybe after 100 years, that's when we'll start moving. <laughs> but in 150 years to come, in 200 years to come, they'll be asking this fundamental question, where was Dr. Gajigo? Mm -hmm. Where was Fatu Ture? Where was Esanya? What were they doing? Exactly. Because development would have reached a stage mm -hmm. when Gambia would have just been taken off and they are ex more exposed they know what is happening around the world and they'll be wondering mm -hmm. what our kid, our parents were doing, what our grandparents were doing. If, if I may say, I mean, I, don't, I think 100 years is too long here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think one generation, when you talk about one generation, we're talking about 20 to 25 years. Yes. Mm. If you, 20 to 25 years alone here. If you, currently, we are in 2023. Mm -hmm. it, you don't even have to go that far. Within one generation, we can completely transform this country from a low-income, fragile country yeah. to a very well of high middle income but what country. do we need Minimum. to what 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 is needed to do that yeah no i mean it's like I, there is no magic here yeah and you are not asking anybody to do any herculean task anything impossible mm -hmm. honestly it's very very simple gambia to, to, for, uh, you first need to change the structure of the economy and that means prioritizing is <coughs> one sector that needs to be prioritized mm -hmm. here which is agriculture okay. Okay. when you start that all the issues that we know that are wrong in the country, you can see how they all become, you know, phys physically they can all be addressed in a very short time period. We talk about the current economic situation, we talk about the cost of living, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. things are just getting worse. Yeah. And, but what are we, uh, I mean, and we know the cost of living is from imported inflation. Mm -hmm. But what are we importing? Most of what we are importing is food, food items. items. Every single one of those food items can be produced here. The biggest item is rice. Yeah. Let's focus on that. Uh, recently, I just came from Jahali Pacha, mm -hmm. you know, that area. Um, do you know, for instance, the, the dikes and the dams that were built in that project, they, they are completely deteriorating over time? And even the few, Gambian, the few Gambian investors that are brave enough to come here, you know, the, the sort of assistance that the Gambia government should give to agricultural investors like Marwa Farms Marwa, yeah. is not there. Musa, yeah. They will tell you they've done some projects here and there, but as a Gambian, as somebody who is active in agriculture, I have a lot of farms, yeah. I can tell you, if you have a great appreciation of the role of agriculture in the development of the country, the sort of assistance that, and the engagement that you should have with Marwa Farms, if you have that, we, uh, by now, we should be at a level that we are. I'm not saying Maru alone can stop our importation of rice. You would need several more. more. But Maru could be a flagship program. A, a program where the government will just say that our incentives and your incentives are aligned. Your success is our success. Your failure is our failure. Mm -hmm. If you have a situation where you have agricultural production, just mm -hmm. productivity increase, you can cut a huge percentage of our imports. By increasing production and productivity, you can also lead to, you know, you, you basically just increase the cost of uh, production and therefore the cost of living. And with increased supply of agricultural produce, whether it's horticulture or traditional agriculture, you can have agricultural processing. This is the beginning stage for industrialization. And once you go into processing, not only are you talking about cutting the essential food items like rice and oil, but even these fast-moving consumer goods that when you go into all of these stores and supermarkets, almost all of which are imported, this can be produced locally. Because you cannot have a production of a good here in the country, you know, when you have to depend on importation and pay high transportation costs of those goods coming in. If you want to make tomato paste here, it's going to be very difficult. Because, you know, obviously you have to take into account many other inputs. But energy will be one thing, what, something he mentioned. 
we have the most expensive electricity in in the con on the continent very expensive Even internet but, is damn expensive yes, but very unreliable mm -hmm. so basically what I, i'm just <clears> hoping, <throat> you know having the investment climate right especially things like energy infrastructure road like um, uh, uh, digital um, technology these are all important parts of it but when you talk about changing the government economy in a reasonably short time period mm -hmm. It has to be focused on agricultural transformation. But when a government is telling you, oh, all I'm doing in that sector is project A, B, and C from development partner X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. they don't have an understanding of that. Because you need to be able to tackle at a fundamental level what are the constraints we are facing agriculture, from traditional agricultural crops to high-value horticultural crops. Right now, if you look at the rice yield in the Gambia, in 1990s, the rice yield of Gambia and Senegal were roughly the same you get two tons per hectare. Mm -hmm. Senegal has now is approaching over three tons, uh, approaching somewhere around four tons per hectare for rice. We are actually going down. We are now, the rice yield in the Gambia is less than two tons <coughs> per hectare. Agricultural production in other things, the yield for all other major agricultural crops are going down. So, but the, the agricultural policy of the Gambia right now is only, is composed of two items. Number one, at the beginning of the rainy season, supply fertilizer yeah. to farmers and a handful of seeds here and there. At the end of the rainy season in December, go and buy the groundnut. This is the totality <laughs> of the Gambian agricultural policy. It's, 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 wow. really, it's really sad. They have almost nothing for horticulture, high-value horticulture, which is very important if you are going to have modern agricultural transformation. So I was very, to me, not surprising, but very disappointed when the president was talking about agriculture, and there was no mention of agricultural transformation, our increase in food production, the, you know, whether all the projects we've done in rice and others, has it led to falling importation <laughs> of rice or increased local production? Has it led to increase in the yield of groundnut, increase in the yield of um, rice, increase in the yield of maize, um, sorghum, and millet? The things, in other words, the things that matter when the government really is serious about changing the economy, they don't talk about that either. As um, um, you know, uh, yes, I was talking about, either they don't understand it or there's just you know uh, deliberate, uh, deliberate um, you know ignorance. I mean, deliberate ignorance or obfuscation of it. So, if this country right now, as it is, agriculture should be the priority sector, and the way when the government is talking about sectors at the State of the Nations address. The, folk, uh, the amount of attention and details that should be from that sector was completely missing in the State of Nation address. So the president uh, doesn't seem to have a clue. And he's been his chief economic agricultural advisor, who is the minister of agriculture, doesn't seem to have an idea what he's doing. Right. He seems to be more involved in political activities than actually running a ministry. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the agricultural sector, I am sure you have a lot, just to be clear here, I'm sure there are a lot of, Ordinary uh, officials at the Ministry of Agriculture who are hardworking, yes. doing their part. But, but you they can't have to blame have a them. direction. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> they need to have a policy direction. Yeah. And that policy direction from the top is missing. So despite their hard work, many of these officials in the ministry, nothing is happening. No. We are still And working. there are a lot of projects no, in the, the agriculture just, just to add, you see, and I want to bring this issue here. Mm. Don't you think also... It's good that you make reference to the Ministry of Agriculture because I was going to point at that. Um, the, 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 the caliber of individuals, the people that we give this. You see, there's this mentality in the Gambian. And unless and until we graduate from that, we're still going to have problems when it co comes to appointing people as ministers. A lot of people will tell you ministers are politicians. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're just, I listened to your interview with, um, with Maimuna Sise, who was telling us that ambassadors are just ceremonial is the deputy ambassador who should be technocrats i mean that's the ministers that no, we say see, that's what i'm saying that is a very i'm very dis anyway i shouldn't say that i'm disappointed because that's her level of understanding mm -hmm. you can't tell us that ambassadors are just you know ceremonials or whatever ceremonial heads ministers we need experts in these areas because the problem is okay the president appointed professor gomez higher education mm -hmm. Because he believes that is his area. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that is his area. Mm -hmm. You appointed Dr. La, um, Ahmad Lamin Samate, Minister of Health, because yeah. that is his area. Yeah. 
okay? Foreign so, affairs. Uh, doctor, foreign affairs, Dr. Tanga. So the reason why you appointed them is because you believe that is their area. Mm -hmm. Even if you are appointing politicians, let it be their area. Mm -hmm. Now, when you listen to Demba Sabali, when you listen to him, you feel sorry for this country. This is not personal, but you feel sorry for this country. That the agricultural sector, the Ministry of Agriculture of this country is in the hands of a man who studied, I don't know, nursing or whatever, at the American International University. And then you came and just handed over the Ministry of Agriculture to that man. All that he will tell you is that the government is doing very well. We are selling fertilizers of 1,000 whatever dollars is. As if this country, agriculture is about fertilizer. It's about buying groundnuts. I, so the right people in the right positions must be there if we want to get things right. But what is happening is that the president is only interested, like you said, mm -hmm. a minister who is only interested in politics. And then on top of that, he's not only putting the wrong people in the ministries, but even the permanent secretaries. Look at how they've been moved. You can get the wrong person in a ministry as minister and then get another person, permanent secretary, where there is not even his expertise. Exactly. We are seeing how these people have been resolved. We saw how uh, people are saying that even the other permanent secretary, I think it's Maimuna Baldes' um, husband, to the extent that, oh, the one ministry is saying, the ambassador is saying that, I don't know how true this, but the ambassador is saying, I cannot work with him. The president has to move him to another ministry and all that. How can you be resolving permanent secretaries like that? Yeah. When you know fully well that your ministers are not all experts in this, and I am saying that must change now. Yes. Let us appoint people in positions where they can lead the, because ministers are supposed to lead the policy directives. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have an idea of a particular sector, how can they lead? They can even be misled. And ministers are supposed to be advisors to the president as well in those particular areas. Mm -hmm. But if the ministers don't know, mm -hmm. they can be misled by their permanent secretary or so, uh, whoever is there, because even the permanent secretary might not have an understanding there. It is only those junior staff who have been there because they have experience there who can advise, wrongly advise or mislead the permanent secretary, and the permanent secretary can mislead the minister, and the minister in turn will mislead the president. And that is why I said, just back to my point of in the future, we might be asked this question, what were you doing? Yeah. I, it just reminds me, even now, some of us ask this question, what happened? What was the Jawara government doing? They could not even establish a university. Exactly. People question that, right? Yeah. And that is why I always say, and I want to say this on records, mm -hmm. that if Jammeh had done one good thing in this country, mm -hmm. is to build the University of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. I'm not thanking him for that mm -hmm. because that's his job. Mm -hmm. But it is to recognize mm -hmm. that he did something good in this country, mm -hmm. that all of us are beneficiaries of that. Yeah. You know, we graduates from the UTG are doing well. Mm -hmm. You know, the universities out there. Mm -hmm. You know, all because the government had a vision to make sure that at least they started university. So we asked that question. What was the Jawara government doing that from 1965 independence up to 1994, they could not establish a university in this country? Well, Our people were going to Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. Forabia College, University of Sierra Leone, all that. So we will be asked this question. That Fatu Ture, Esa, Dr. Gadi. If you Bakuda. ask what has the borough government been doing, they're building infrastructure, roads. You see, Fatu, <laughs> we, we don't want to get into that. Borough but has been no roads you know very well. government. You know very well why we were late for this program <laughs> at some point. <laughs> we are struggling to reach here. <laughs> and those of you that are watching outside know that it's been raining in this country. <laughs> and whenever it rains, even for an hour or 30 minutes, the roads are flooded. Exactly. Sometimes you come up to the way and realize that, no, I have to go back, take another <laughs> way. So the terrible road infrastructure in this country, don't talk about the, I mean, OIC roads. We've talked about what that did Dr. Siddharth <laughs> job here. So I, I think everything, there's fundamentally wrong with everything in this country. And we need a complete revamp of the system in order to address um, the problems that we have. Talking about complete revamp of the system, the Minister of Finance has said that the Gambia government has signed um, a hundred million agreement with Africa 50. hundred million dollars, huh? hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. An infrastructure investment platform mm -hmm. founded by the African Development Bank, mm -hmm. right? The agreement is to manage and operate the Senegambia Bridge, a major crossing point connecting the southern and northern banks of the River Gambia. Now, Dr. Gajigo, you worked at the ADB. Mm -hmm. Now, first, let's look at what is the Africa 50 first before we yeah. can look at the, <coughs> the, the uh, management plan that we have signed. Yeah. No, this is a, Africa is a recent creation of, uh, by the ADB. You mm -hmm. know, um, 
Um, yeah. uh, infrastructure has been a mm -hmm. priority area for the African Development Bank for, for a long time now. Mm -hmm. yes. And despite the fact okay. that in their normal usual projects, for you know, they, uh, okay. they do a lot of infrastructure financing, but mm. the, given the infrastructure deficit on the continent, yeah. they just, they are asked to do a lot more. So mm -hmm. including the set of private equity funds, yeah. um, um, they've, they've given financial institutions to, uh, I mean, finance, uh, financing to financial institutions and, and governments. But this thing was basically a platform to, to basically accelerate the investment into uh, infrastructure in, 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 uh, on the continent. It's mm -hmm. based in Casablanca. Mm -hmm. It's operating um, you know, as a standalone uh, commercial entity. It was, it was formed jointly by the African Development Bank and uh, African uh, government. Government. Yes. So we have signed a joint development agreement here by 50, Africa 50 will now pay the government of the Gambia forward con, uh, current terms, $100 million, the value of the bridge as we speak. Mm -hmm. And then we'll manage the concession on the, on the management of the tolls. And the concession is for a period of 25 years mm -hmm. or a target IIRR of, for investment of 15%, mm -hmm. whichever comes first. Mm -hmm. They say, the minister said, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. this is an innovative financing mechanism whereby public assets are now recycling and the cash flows that are coming <coughs> from there will be used towards generating additional infrastructure asset. So that's what we call asset recycling, and then the agreement have been signed uh, by the Minister of Finance. He, he said it at the CNBC Africa yes. Network. Yeah, um, well, um, so uh, of course asset recycling is not... Um, is, uh, what? The, for me, first is... Mm -hmm. What does this mean? You know, for some of us who don't understand all these technical yeah. terms, it's a little complicated. Right. I saw people saying it's mortgage. I'm like, no, but we're mm -hmm. getting 100 million. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of money, right? Right. <laughs> so can you tell that's, somebody... That's a lot of money. Yeah, what, what, yeah. what exactly <laughs> did we sign in a simple layman's yeah. term? Well, I don't know exactly what we signed, and that's one of my... According the, the, to what he said, yeah. Yeah, the basic... That's one of my questions. Mm. I would like to know what mm. is actually signed, because one of the things that we don't have access to yeah. is what is in the concession agreement. Okay. So we, we can, right now, we can talk about what asset management is in general. If, okay. You know, these details that we have so far, the 25 is 15% IRR, yeah. uh, 100 million, these are just uh, basic details. But the actual, um, some of the key details that you need for some of these are still unknown. Yeah. But asset, uh, you are right, it's a, very, uh, it's a technical term, and it's very important when government officials are talking about things like this, the use terminology that the average person can understand, understand yeah. because when you are using akin terms usually it means two things you know yeah. <laughs> either you are trying to hide something or you don't understand it very well mm. so there are there are two aspects of uh, asset recycling <coughs> on one part talking about monetizing mm -hmm. an existing asset that has a value through future streams of income okay yes the second part is once you Get, um, uh, get value from that, like some entity is willing to pay some upfront value for that. The second part, important part of it is what you are going to do with that proceeds. So far, our dis the discussions I have seen about uh, this asset recycling agreement with Africa 50 mm. is, um, is focusing only on this fourth aspect that, okay, we've gotten $100 million from um, Africa 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the government and Africa 50 will f uh, create an uh, SPV, a um, special uh, purpose vehicle, which is just a new commercial entity that yeah. will, be, um, uh, it will be a new separate legal entity. Mm -hmm. The ownership of that will be, I think, about almost what, um, it will be majority Africa 50. Government will, be, will have a, s a small percentage of that. Okay. I forgot what the percentage, but I, I know at least three quarters will be owned by uh, Africa 50. Okay. Government will be a minority shareholder of, of, of that SPV. And that SPV now will be in charge, uh, you know, its activity will be governed by this concession. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I, 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 there's a lot of discussion on us. Is this a, a sale of an asset, a mortgaging of an asset, or a debt? Yeah. It could be any of those. That, uh, to answer that clearly and objectively, you would need to know what the details of the concession, concession agreement. Is. That is one thing the government hasn't uh, made clear yet. Because what is, um, so the government is, the reason why you would want to do this is, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, because yeah. I, I have a couple of questions, but yeah. the reason why you'd want to do this would be, okay, 
we have this asset that I mean this bridge that was built at the cost of a little over 90 million dollars yeah uh, but we know each year it's going to generate several hundred uh, million dollars in toll yeah. over time. Uh, but currently the country has <coughs> a lot of need for infrastructure. Yeah. So how about I get that money up front, I invest it in infrastructure. You know, and the, while that future stream of income will then go to that uh, new entity. Mm -hmm. But but remember, it's a, it's a, you know, again, we said uh, the key part here is you want that money up front for something. Mm -hmm. You know, for this sort of arrangement to work, for it to, for it to be any value to the economy, that money you get up front, it needs to be specified yeah. what you are going to use, use it, for. it for. So far, it is not specified. Yeah. And when it's not specified, then there is no accountability for the government in terms of what they spend it for. It can go into uh, order, as we already spoke about, this government doesn't have uh, good discipline in terms of how the money is prioritized and spent. Yeah. When that is not made upfront clear as to where the money would go, it can easily be put to unproductive uses. Yes. And basically, somebody would not be wrong by saying the government is mortgaging on our asset yeah. or selling our asset. Mm -hmm. So, there are a couple of details. The first detail that I would want to know is, how was the $100 million uh, reached? Wow. Because that would be some sort of an agreement. You have to do a negotiation and agree on the value of an asset. asset. You know, so how is that um, a negotiate? How is that agreement done? Yeah. You know, and whenever you have a government uh, negotiating against a commercial entity, you have to be very careful. We know it doesn't matter. It could be a country far more developed than the Gambia. You will never have the capacity, the equal capacity with a commercial investor in an area they are specialized in. Mm -hmm. That's why they have facilities at African Development Bank called the African Legal Support Facility. Mm -hmm. That is, they are free of charge yeah. to help governments negotiate. And Gambia government is aware of that. So if they went and negotiated this with Africa 50 without getting some asset assistance, they have done some, it, it's, it's really financial malpractice. Because <coughs> how, how, how can I be confident? How can you be confident? How can ESA be confident that that 100 million is proper valuation of the bridge? Of the bridge. And so when you are talking about the negotiation, there is a key variable. So mm. the, the, the value of the bridge today is the net present value of the future stream of that income. Mm. And that future stream of income is dependent on the traffic flow. So this is the most important variable, the projected traffic flow. The traffic flow currently and the projected one over the next 25 years. So the government needs to have a very good idea of how many vehicles per day cross so that they know how much we are supposed to collect, not only today, yeah. but in the future. I mean, it's important for them to know that today yeah. because they, that, that way they can able to know how much <coughs> of these uh, funds are slipping away mm -hmm. through mismanagement yeah. or other malpractices. But also it helps them in their negotiation. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I was listening to an um, interview yesterday, um, you know, I think it happened a few days ago. Uh, at, on West Coast Radio, where the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Works were all talking. And this uh, is very unfortunate that these very important details that we need yeah. to have a very concrete, objective, and, 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 and substantive conversation about this, these details are not brought forward. Because the Minister actually said something here uh, in that interview that was a bit... Uh, um, I found uh, disturbing because he said the government is in the process of setting up an infrastructure fund. Now, that should have preceded this asset recycling thing by a long time. You mm -hmm. needed to have an, a, either a trust fund or an infrastructure fund well set up before. and established well before you have this agreement so that when the money comes, you already know where it it's is going, going to, to. Yeah. and that amount is ring fenced for only specific infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. But you've already signed this agreement and you are talking about, oh, we have spoken to a few Gambian experts here and there and we are in the process of setting it up. You've put in the card before the horse. So it, uh, I think everyone should be concerned, not because in principle this is a bad idea. On paper, a lot of things are good ideas on paper. Mm -hmm. It's when the rubber hits the ground, yeah. you know, in the details, the implementation details, that, that's where the real issue is. So... In the concession agreement, this could be, you know, uh, you, you could actually say this is a sale. There could be a partial sale, partial ownership. But again, like I said, unless we know 
the details of the concession agreement, which, mm. by the way, should be public, because yeah. this is a public, uh, is, 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 is in essence a public-private partnership, and these things should be, should, be, should be open to the public so that we can judge it. But the problem right now is this government has a very mm. poor track record of releasing information that should be public. But, but, but the, the, the thing itself is this. The government cannot go into any of these contracts without... <laughs> The national without going uh, getting approval from the national yes, assembly, which they have not done. Yeah, because I just saw the pro uh, contracts committee okay. programs and implementation committee say they are sanctioning the minister because they they don't know about this, they don't know the details of this contract, yeah. and the contract has been signed. And someone is even saying that the one who wrote on the standard is saying that I don't know because I'm not a lawyer, but he's saying that there is violation of section 155 of you know the, of the constitution which says it should be stable at the national assembly this should be yeah this yeah. should be you know they need to get the national assembly approval first yeah. before they can get into any of these kind of pa partnerships but that hasn't happened mm -hmm. and we don't know the details like you said the de the devil is in the details of this contract it can all look good uh, like up there this is about over 600 million dollars we are talking about and right now they have signed the contract and on behalf of all of us, yeah. but we don't know. And for 25 years, you know, this bridge will be managed by Africa 50. And, and the, yesterday when we had Dr. Um, Tirad Job here, and his argument is more of when we go into partnerships, when we go into negotiations, do we have the right capacity, exactly. the right te technical know-how to negotiate on behalf of our people? Because we have seen what happened with the security port contract. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even the Ministry of Justice mm -hmm. uh, uh, went against it. Yeah. But the government has put us in a very bad contract mm -hmm. with security port. And now, even if they want to go out, they cannot. They cannot. Because of what they have negotiated. Mm -hmm. they, so it seems there was not uh, real expertise there. Yeah. When you go to partnership with international bodies and other things, you need seasoned, seasoned international representation mm -hmm. to be able to properly carve out mm -hmm. these details. Yeah. Do you think that can be some of the issues that we might have with this 50 plus, uh, 50, we could have gotten more out yeah. of this? Maybe. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, going back to Esa's point, it's, you know, you need to make sure you put the right people in the right places. It starts from there. Okay. You know, um, there is this uh, famous saying that I like to use quite a bit where there is this uh, one man, um, he's, he's, he's quite known for like, um, he's, he's General Boyd, it's an American general who is quite known for implementing projects very well at grand levels, you know, that have many complex moving parts. And he's always said the most important thing that you need is people first, mm -hmm. ideas, and then machines or money in that order. Okay. You know, no matter what you are doing, if you don't have the right people in place, you can have the, all the money in the world and people can supply you with all the ideas. As long as you have the wrong people there, it won't work. It has to start with that, the right people. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I, that's very relevant to this point you are saying. Yeah. When it comes to negotiations, even <coughs> countries richer than the Gambia, yeah. you don't go and negotiate commercial contract with a commercial entity, whether they are domestic or foreign, without making so that you have the right people in there. And sometimes the right person, it's not, it's not like, for instance, having, you know, Esa there or Usman there sitting at the but, but someone like Esa Usman recognizing that we need expertise here, let's go and get that expertise. Mm. And the government cannot even say they don't have experience because we, we know there are examples of this government where we've had some agreements, um, some mm -hmm. negotiations where we, go, we did the right things. Mm. In the Ministry of Petroleum, yeah. on several occasions, they approached the African Legal Support Facility from the African Development Bank. They got the assistance they needed and they negotiated with international major oil companies like British Petroleum and they got huge amounts of resources for us. Wow. Now, uh, but as you point out, there are many examples. Ministry of Fisheries, like the agreement they signed with EU, EU. years ago, yeah. Security Poor, some energy deals we've had. There is, there is no shortage of examples where the government just thought it's a matter of them sitting across uh, the table from another investor without knowing that right behind those people you have very seasoned experts, specialized ones whose fiduciary responsibility is getting the best deal for their uh, uh, their side. They, 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 they are not interested in what's good for the Gambia. They are interested in what's good for that side. When you have a situation like that with such a lopsided representative, we will never come out with a fair deal. 
Now, I don't know in this particular Africa 50 deal when the negotiation was being, when the negotiation was being done, who was present. Um, but you know, the fact that, that such an information wasn't publicized suggests that most likely we did not get any outside <coughs> assistance. And if that is the case, it means there is a real chance that maybe even the 100 million that was agreed may not be the best valuation of Senegal Bay Bridge. We know that this bridge was built at the cost of around over 90 million dollars. Yeah. And we know that over uh, the traffic from northern Senegal to southern Senegal, Senegal, this is the only traffic. Senegal is growing, even though we are not growing as we should, but Senegal is growing. Yeah. There, are, there are a lot of reasons why traffic on that bridge should go. So if you are talking about evaluation and then you say yeah. you got 100 million from Africa 50, it is incumbent upon you as a government official to say, we, we can assure the Gambian public that we got the best value for this asset. And uh, how can we prove that? Because we know that this is the traffic projection and this is our projection for the total revenue over time. And mm. therefore, 100 million mm. is a fair valuation of this project. But none of the ministers I've heard speak gave any details to, to allow us to have a very you know complete and fair assessment of this arrangement so i think going back to your question it is very um it, it should be concerning to us as to whether you know the this sort of uh, agreement when it was being negotiated <coughs> did we have the right people, people at the table, table. and the, peop the people at the table did they consult the best gambians or the best people outside because remember, the resources out there are they are free. Mm. You could go to Africa Legal Support Facility and get they'll give you money free for you to go and get the best lawyers anywhere. Not only within the Gambia, but even mm -hmm. as in, even in London or, or New York. Wow! You know, all you have to do uh, to do is to go and ask for it. So if you, as a government official, go and negotiate an agreement with a commercial entity and get a bad deal, it's not only improper. Uh, the way I see it is actually a criminal misconduct. <coughs> Crime. Yeah. Crime. But Isa, my thing even is this, for something like this, something so huge, we just get to hear it from CBNBC. And just yesterday when people started coming and saying they're mortgaging, they're doing all of this, the minister went to, uh, I think, Peter Gomez yeah. to say it. Our governments get into these kind of contracts, a lot of them. Security poor, all other contracts, and they don't even inform us. <coughs> the fact that they did not even go to the National Assembly, the fact that we don't even know about this, just because the minister had an interview somewhere, you try to get them to talk to you, they don't, they don't want to talk to nobody. But because somebody just brought it, people started saying they're mortgaging, people started talking on the social media, they went to the radio to, to do a uh, 45 uh, minutes interview and just say what they feel uh, like just saying. For, 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 what does that say about for us the, as I, a people? I, I must say, I must say this, I must say this that I wouldn't um, take it back, that this government is a joke. Um, you see, the second example of the Banjul um, project, when the mess was already created, what did they do? They went and gathered the OIC conference center. They call it a major press conference. Ministers who had no idea of what the Banjul project was about or who had an idea were all put together. Even the Minister, Minister of Higher Education, when I saw him seated there, I said, I don't know what he's doing here. Probably he has no idea what, what, what <laughs> all transpired because he was not even there when this... So you gathered all those people. You brought the, is it the, I mean, uh, the consultant to come and make a presentation. This country, is, this country and this government are jokes. Yeah. You brought those people to come and... Pre who are you even presenting to? Who? Is it the Gambian people that you are presenting to? My grandma in Tankular has no idea what was happening at that um, um, OIC conference center. So what was the essence of even that so-called major press conference that you called? That was a joke. Yeah. You talk about this project as well. And two fundamental questions. When it comes to this agreement that they signed, I call it mortgaging, okay? And just like Dr. Gajigo said, mm -hmm. people will be within their rights to use any term. Because this is, this is what happens when you leave people in information blackout. When you're not transparent as a, gov as a government, when you don't tell people what is happening, you leave them to speculate. And they will have the right to speculate because you are not I'm clear to them. I read everything and I did not see, in fact, what was signed. And two fundamental questions are raised here. <clears throat> was there any proper 
consultation mm -hmm. with the Gambian people, with relevant stakeholders, before this agreement was being signed. There was no proper consultation, public consultation especially. Yeah. And again, was that somebody raised this question, was there even international bidding, mm. proper international bidding, mm. before giving this to, to, to uh, signing this agreement with Africa 50? Mm. So those details are not clear. Even if there was bidding, I doubt it. Even if there was, it was not clear to the Gambian people. So meaning we have a government that is taking Gambians for a ride, like they, they're not taking us serious. Um, all that they will do is that, yes, just like I said, they know that Gambians are used to, they're just used to scandals now. People will talk about these two, three days, and they are done with it. Nothing will come out of it. So we have a government that is playing with the Gambian people, playing with our intelligence, playing with our minds, knowing fully well that they can do these things and get away with them. So when there is lack of transparency, and no wonder, even the Transparency International, when they come, came up with their you know, corruption index report, Gambia is very high on corruption. And when a country... Um, scores higher or scores bad on the corruption index, it indicates that, oh, oh, sorry, let me put it this way. When there is lack of transparency, it can lead to corruption. Yeah. Because when government is doing dubious acts, they wouldn't want to be transparent. And when country performs bad on the corruption index, it indicates that there is lack of transparency in that country. Mm -hmm. You've just mentioned that, you know, even not, them not being transparent here, even the terms that they use, the technical terms that they use, either they they, they, they're doing something bad that they are hiding from the people that they don't want people to know or maybe they have no idea of what they are talking about they don't even understand the terms they just use these terms because those are the terms that are used okay. but fundamentally for me it is more about them not you know willing to be transparent mm. to the Gambian people so where we are and that's why I talk about, you know, the, the, one of the flaws of representative democracy. Even this vehicle issue, when it came, I said, look, even the parliamentarians, mm -hmm. this might not even be an issue of discussion, even if it is not a discussion at parliament, but even the parliamentarians, just out of, for the sake of representative democracy, can even go to their people and say, well, this is what is happening. Government is willing to give us vehicles. We're going to pay this amount or this percentage, and you, the taxpayers, will pay this percentage. There's nothing wrong with that. That is about yeah. being transparent. To your people. Being responsive and representative to your people, because mm -hmm. you are there as a representative of the... You are there as the voice of the voiceless. Yeah. So um, a representative democracy calls for public consultation. People are not aware of, of this. If, I mean, imagine you and I that are constantly on the media, on the internet. Mm -hmm. We are not even aware of this. Just think of how about, how about my grandma in Tankular, your grandma in Badibu, somebody's grandma or grandparent in, you know, Sarebojo, all the way in URR and another place. What, do they have an idea what is happening in this country? Mm -hmm. Just like I said here last time, the only thing people know that something is happening in the Gambia is when there is... Um, when there is there are fees, maybe there are toba, there is Tobaski. Everybody knows that Gambia is observing Tobaski. Even <laughs> someone in this in Sarebojo. When they, so these are the things that people know. But how government is running the affairs of this country, nobody knows anything about it. This government is reactionary and not proactive. So exactly what is happening is you have a government that is not transparent, and usually when these things come up and then people start talking about it, they feel being present at some point. Sankara, as usual, will come, will come with his jargons, you know, terms that you cannot even understand using his literary terms. This government is this, this in the info is fallacious, is this, is that. The government is trying to do this. I mean, I'm not, this country is a joke, Fatou. I'm sorry to say. And uh, talking about that, not telling us anything, Minister of Works also, uh, in that interview, we talked about the... They're talking about the Banjul Barra Bridge, mm. you know, also um, <laughs> bridging the Banjul Barra yeah. crossing point, right? I mean, the Badibunkas and the Nyominkas will be happy about that. Yes. Sector. <laughs> but, you know, I think what is the, is the details again? Yeah. Because he's talking about, they don't know whether it's going to be ECOWAS or whoever, ADB. It seems like they don't even know who is funding it. Is the Gambian taxpayers funding that bridge? Can well, we do it? <laughs> I, I'm, I have a lot of family members in Badibu. I know it will, it will be great news for me if it happens, but we have to be realistic here. I mean, if the bridge materializes, it will be of tremendous value to the country. It will help us significantly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as they say, if, uh, wishes, um, <laughs> you know, if everything is just based on wishes, you know, we won't have any problem. It won't be the real world. The fact of the matter is... That will make my 
my village the most lucrative. Mandinari. Because ah, it's supposed to be called for. Yes. It's it's supposed, yeah, the land is going, going to be a mandinari, but right there, you know, that is. Banjul. Okay. Yeah, not banjul. Ban no, ban it, yes, it has, to be, it has to be mandinari, but that bridge would have to be about roughly 8 kilometers. That, the stretch of the river is about 7 kilometers, so, but the bridge would have to extend beyond that, so it would be about 8 kilometers. Wow. To put it in perspective, that bridge would be extremely expensive, number one. If a minister is talking about realistically building that bridge, they need to, I mean, if the minister knows what he's talking about, he needs to mention the cost. Because by mentioning the cost, then you can talk about who has a realistic chance of funding. Can it be built directly by the government or through taxpayers, or can it be uh, funded um, with development partners like ADB <coughs> or World Bank, or can it be funded by a commercial financing? Our GDP, the total GDP of the Gambia, that is the total income of every entity in the Gambia, is two billion. Two billion. That bridge today, if you want to build it, would be close to two billion. So number one, so the, uh, our total budget is about five hundred million dollars. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So it's a fraction of that. And you know, <laughs> in any project like this, whether it's a flagship or not, it, only a fraction of the budget can go to can go to a single project. So. Mm -hmm. It's out of the question that the Gambia government can build the bridge on its own. The next question is, can it be, be, can it be built by ADB or ECOWAS? ECOWAS. No. The, uh, you see, ADB is a development bank, but it's, don't forget there's the word bank there also. Okay. It, whatever financing it does, it has a sustainable lending limit for each country and for each sector. And that limit is determined by whether you are a high-risk country or whether you are a big country. There's a limit on it. And I can tell you, uh, on, in a, on a three-year uh, period, that limit cannot um, exceed uh, even 50 million. Mm. The reason why this bridge was built at a cost of over 90 million because it was uh, considered a regional project. Yeah. So there was allocation from Senegal that went to it and allocation mm. from the Gambia. Gambia. But the amount of ADB financing to the Gambia for a given project, currently given our size and our risk rating and the fact that we are a fragile country, cannot even be more than 50 million. We're talking about a project that is 2 billion. Wow. When you also want to, uh, so 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 um, uh, ADB, um, ADB forget about, forget and about. ADB has more money to finance a project than ECOWAS. ECOWAS. So if ADB can't, I don't think ECOWAS uh, can. If we are talking about the two billion project, and if we are talking about ADB or ECOWAS financing, we have to ask on what terms? Is it a concessional loan, or is it some sort of uh, development finance? finance? You know. You have to be able to answer this question. And, and a commercial financing, if any investor is coming in, or if it's going to be a PPP, well, they are going to bring their money in, and there has to be a loan from outside. But if a commercial investor is coming in, they are going to have to be paid. Now, you have to think about then, if the bridge is built, there's going to be a toll over it. And that toll will be chosen so that that investors are able to get back, recoup their invest, uh, investment, plus a certain return on it, over a certain time period, and it will not be more than 25 years. Uh, a, a simple calculation will show you that if somebody, let's say, finances this bridge and they want to put a, and it's going to cost $2 billion, mm -hmm. and they want to put a toll on it to recoup their investment within a 25-year period or a 30-year period, the toll that you would require to, to cross the bridge, if you are lucky, it will be maybe $5,000 per vehicle. Oh. So... The point I'm uh, trying to come to, yeah. yeah. The point I'm coming to, you know, we have to be serious. You know, I'm going to echo uh, Esa here. If you are a minister and you are going to talk about a bridge like that, you uh, about financing that bridge and something that has a real value to the country, you, you you have to bring some seriousness into the discussion by adding some details there and don't raise the hopes of people. Uh, without actually thinking very carefully as to how expensive but that this was a be. campaign promise by the president. The president actually gave us timeline the time you know he spoke about this bridge. Yeah. And yeah, I know that timeline has gone past. Yeah. But <laughs> well, and it will go past again. And I can give you an, let me just mm -hmm. be concrete here. Yeah. The bridge in Seregambe Bridge. Yeah. Uh, it's two kilometers long. It's mm. 12 meters wide. And it costs us 90 million. 90 million. Yeah. That, that, uh, a bridge like that, given that stretch of the river and given the geology we have there, the cost came down to about 4,000 US dollars per square meter. If you're going to bridge, build a bridge around, you know, close to the coast, around Mandinaring, to go to the North Bank, you're going to, you are dealing with a very wider part, number one. is The, the, the road would have to be bigger, yeah. longer, but the real cost comes from the fact that it would have to be higher. 
because you want to keep the river navigable, which is why the Gambia Bridge has a certain clearance above the river. And the clearance that you need to have around this Mandinarim part would have to be even way higher than the clearing you have over there. So on per square meter basis, you are going to actually look at something that is twice the cost, uh, per square meter, twice the cost of the Senegambia Bridge. Remember, the Senegambia Bridge was done over a decade ago. Yeah. Between then and now, what has happened to cost of everything? Everything has gone high. Has gone up significantly. Yeah. So the point is, if you are talking about a project that is going to be over a billion dollars, that's going to approach the total GDP of the country, you know, you have to be realistic. The fact of the matter is no one should be fooled by this. I mean, I would be the, I would be the happiest person if this bridge is built. I mean, you know, me and millions of others like you and everyone will benefit from it. Yeah. But it's, you know, you are not, um, it, it's not a mark of seriousness to come, to go and repeat uh, on fulfill campaign promises when you have no realistic plan. I mean, before you, even, as a government, before you even mention this, there should be a real feasibility study. They have, they have done some mini feasibility ones. And that already indicated that you are going to need a huge amount of money. The fact of the matter, uh, I mean, I don't think our minister really knows what he's talking about in this particular case. So if anybody has a uh, personal plans or investment plans to do along the Mandina Ring or the other side of Badibu uh, that is going to be based on this bridge being built, I would say you wait for a while first. I was going to go to Mandina yeah. to build to build the Kerfado studios in Mandina Ring. Now that we're going to get a bridge. I, I, I suggest you wait for a while. Let wow. the next conversation, any, uh, when the minister brings these things up, people should ask him, number one, what do you think is going to be the approximate the cost, cost, cost of this bridge? And what is the, mod, um, the, the modality that you have in mind for financing this? Is it going to be some PPP project? And what do you, if it's going to be PVP, what is the share of the government financing that's going to go into it? And that share of the government financing, is it going to come from taxpayers' money or is it going to be borrowed from somewhere else? You know, if you are thinking of um, some international institutions, which ones do you have in mind? And are you, sh I mean, how can you be certain that they have the, the, the financial bandwidth to actually provide the financing needed? So I don't think the minister was being serious at all. I don't think the minister has been serious. Final message. At this point, I don't know what else, <laughs> what else to say. I think we have, we have said everything. Um, <sighs> just to say um, a big thank you to um, Dr. Gadigo. I think that was um, a very fruitful discussion. Yeah. Um, it has revealed a lot of things that are happening in the country, um, a lot of things that people are not aware of. Um, just also to say that um, we must um, hold our government to account. Mm -hmm. We have a government that is not taking us serious. Um, knows very well that um, you know we have passive citizens and not active citizens, but um, I must I must also say that um, you know it's it's very disappointing um, when a government talks about being democratic, um, you know trying to promote democratic accountability. It's not transparent when it comes to finances and public you know projects and all that. Um, this is not helping the Gambia. Um, you know it is only going to aggravate the current situation that we are in. Um, so Gambians must continue to hold the government to account, um, but, you know, from the executive to the parliament and all other elected representatives and public officials must be held accountable continuously. Mm. Otherwise, they will continue to take us in serious and, you know, where we, what, where we want to be as a country, um, we wouldn't get there. So um, once again, um, thank you, Dr. Gadigo, for, you know, this opportunity to have this fruitful conversation. Um, yeah. Dr. Gajigo, thank you so much for coming. And I, we, you know, we, Lavin Tom was saying, you, you should go to the point first. I said, no, 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 let's start with me. Now the doctor is free. But, but have you also contributed on the community of government scholars, Lisa? Uh, at some point I was, but not anymore. Not yeah. anymore, yeah. Yes. I think I remember. Doctor that has been a frequent, <laughs> you know, on the branch yeah. and also obviously yeah. Uh, yeah. writing yeah. articles. I enjoyed my, my presence here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. But, Thank you and welcome back again. And of course, you can follow Dr. He'll be writing more now. Mm -hmm. Now he's free and also he'll be appearing more on the brunch and programs like this. And of course, I think you should go on the Bantaba. No, I the Grand Bantaba. Bantaba. Yeah. The Grand Bantaba is yeah. now the, the EAT program now. So we'll yeah. be expecting you to have you on that as well. Thank, Thank you me. very much. And until we come your way next week, inshallah. Good night to you all. See you next week.
Yiruwa men kafata na tarambulo luto Nga GIA Kago Complex Parendile Puruka Julaya Sone Yandi Kadungoni mfunti bunda na doko Sembentu ya Banjul International Airport Oto Mensi nyafa si moluma Melika fengo luki bantala banko lukang Anin julandingo lufana Faisi sula na kago doko la lebang Katu masingo lube mbulule Ikafome ye forklifts Melika selendiro ni njindiro ke baka solula Melbe funti kangu waranto kaduna na waya hauso lukono Nga dinkira sumayari ngo lufana soto le ifula Mila fano mu metari kemeleti Karo bela adung isi kago baka solu tano Mensi ta for ton town war. Ila suma ya fana futata tembele to. Menka fendolu mabono fo ikana atinya. Fosene fengolu lombang. Domori fengolu. Waranto jata kende ya ni mbori ma fengolu. Kago baga solu la taradula kendo. Asulata jama ni labang korosiri langolu lela. Na double view x-ray korosiri la masengolu. Aka kago baga so kono kono jubele. Komi kago do kuo sartoli ya landi nyameng. Nyin double view x-ray. Amu jama ni labang rapid scanner leti. Menka karafula korosiro keno kago sifa bela. Wati kilingo kono to. Na doku lalo. Imu ayata karandingo leti. Mili ela doku o no e faramansata kago doku o na tamandiri nyato na doku o la betea Wayem futan di RA3 makamoleto mensa tinna fo nse kago bagaso lu kinole kata UK aning EU banko lu kang GIA ka hakili tenkungo dila na doku o to ite nyina la men Every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon. To make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets with a liberal air transportation policy. That daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators and for a highly ranked tourist destination the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority, we go beyond daily.